Okay, guys, can I bring attention? Uh, Octay Arslan from uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory at Caltech is here today to give me a race car lecture. Um, so, I'll be quiet and look forward to a great lecture. Thanks, Octay. Uh, thank you for a kind introduction. Can you hear me, guys? Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Octay. Uh, I just landed like 30 minutes ago from airport. <laughs> Uh, I am a robotic technologist at NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, my group is Robotic Decision Estimation and Control Group. Uh, at JPL, I develop motion planning algorithms for a variety of robotic platforms. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about um, uh, why do we need to learn this subject? Because we heavily use uh, motion planning algorithm to uh, drive the rover over Mars. For example, in our recent project, uh, like uh, in, 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 in one of the drive cases, uh, the rover got stuck at this sand dune, and it, uh, it took five weeks to get the uh, rover out of that sand dune. And people, they, they planned the motion, every motion of the rover to get, get it out there. And it was very uh, risky for the mission because, uh, as you know, on Mars you don't have AAA. If you have something happen to your rover, the game is over. And it was a $1 billion project. And people, they got so nervous uh, when the rover got stuck here and they tried to take it out from this. And this is pretty dense, like a deep sand. Uh, and after these ex experiences, they tried to develop um, like uh, some uh, more sophisticated motion planning algorithms. Um, for example, this is a, one of our new uh, like latest demo. So this, this is a, um, it's a small test that we use for motion planning. It has similar capabilities of the exact rover. And uh, in this project, we try to, uh, we try to identify uh, non-geometric hazards, like uh, these sand dunes. So there's an onboard terrain classifier. It uses a machine learning algorithm. It takes camera pictures. Maybe it's better to So here, uh, we try to get the rover from this initial position to the goal, and there are some obstacles. We assume some people on Mars left over their buckets, so we try to avoid them. <laughs> so here, uh, at the background, the path planning algorithm search possible path that is encoding this graph. And as you can see, it's pretty dense graph. And once uh, it picks the path somehow that minimizes some cost, like path length or like this, the smoothest path, then this path is sent to Athena rover for execution. Classifier and path planner were integrated with the rover and its clarity. 
very software architecture through a newly developed interface based on the robot operating system, or ROS. We also developed the Athena simulator based on the Rome's physics-based simulator with an identical ROS interface. Future work includes the integration of the terrain classifier, the path planner, and the perception system of the Athena rover. So that was one application of a path planner in the context of rover navigation. You can also apply these things to some other t type of vehicles. Like for example, in this project, we try to do motion planning for a quadrature, and here the quadrature is staying here, and we, we command the quadrature to go to a desired pose, and we want it to go as fast as possible. They, ha they, may, they may seem to be different vehicles, but at the end of the day, they have the same physics, they have the same math, and if you know how to do motion planning for one of them, then you can apply the same technique to other, vehicle, other type of vehicles. So today I'm going to talk about a little bit about how we can do motion planning. So, <clears throat> and a little bit announcement, like these lectures are compiled from these people and if you would like to learn more you can refer to these, their websites. So when we do motion planning, we usually have uh, a, a pipeline of something like this. So this is the global planner and it has some map information and users send some uh, commands to like go to X, Y, or Z, like very far away point. And in this block, we have a big map. And this may be, let's say, I don't know, uh, 500 meter by 500. And our vehicle is here. And maybe it's command to go here. So what this guy does, and there, are, there may be some obstacles or some uh, here. What this guy does, it computes a sequence of waypoints that minimize some costs. And it feeds what we call as a path. And this is nothing but a waypoint one Waypoint two, waypoint n. And we have another block. It's called local planner. So what this does, it takes the the exist the next waypoint and it tries to generate a speed command. And uh, these speed commands may be different. The, the, it depends the vehicle you are driving. For example, if you have a, a mobile robot, usually called unicycle. So this is kind of a, a wheeled robot. And it has a velocity. And it is also, it may have a rotational velocity as well. So if you have this type of robot, then a speed command will be desired forward speed and desired angular speed. Then we have another block uh, called controller. I think Kyle Teach taught this class like a couple of days ago. And this thing takes these desired speed commands and converts to some actuator commands. Of course, then we have our robot. And let's say we have actuator here. 
and we have this robot. So this is the pipeline. Uh, I, Kyle taught this how to design controller. Today I'm going to talk about this block. And simply, the input for this block will be a waypoint and obstacle location. And this guy will take this waypoint and obstacle location and try to generate speed commands in a way that this robot will move to, to desired waypoint while avoiding this obstacle. Then once we learn this, then we will have another block that I'm going to teach tomorrow. And we will, we will use some search algorithm how to uh, generate high level paths. So, for now, I'm going to talk about the local planner. And uh, we use a specific method, and we use artificial uh, potential field method. So, like I said, the problem we are looking at is like pictorially, can, it can be explained like this the robot has an initial state, and we would like to reach this. So, uh, People, they thought about this problem and they said, uh, maybe we can treat this problem as like a, your goal is at the bottom of a ball and you have some little bit uh, like a hill here. And they say, what will happen if you leave the ball from here? Then this is the kind of animation that explains how this method works. So what, what, we, what we are trying to do here, actually try to generate some force field so that when the vehicle follows this force field, it will avoid these obstacles and it will reach the goal. So usually at the goal you have a attractive force and at the obstacle you have what we call repul repulsive fo force. So that is when you try to approach the obstacle, it will push away and when you get close to goal, uh, those attractive forces will uh, get, you to the, get you towards the goal. So the whole idea of this potential field method is how to generate those force fields. So, uh, <clears throat> so in order to generate those force fields, like, uh, we, we define a function which is called potential function. And this potential function is nothing but assigns a value to every point in your search space. Like if you do motion planning for, uh, let's say your uh, search space is 2D. And you pick a point x, y. And what uh, this function, potential function does is, so it takes this point and map it to a value, let's say u. Sometimes this is larger here. Sometimes it is smaller here. Let's say this is, I don't know, 1. You pick another one, another point x1, y1, it may be 2. So you, you try, so you try to define this function. Once you have this function, usually this function is kind of, uh, it is 0 at your goal point. So if the robot is here, and you know the, uh, the value of the u, and you look around, and you try to go in a way that this u value, uh, the, the energy will be minimized. So if you just keep doing this, like if you follow the gradient, like the, the maximum decrease of the potential function, and you expect you will eventually keep decreasing, and you will eventually uh, reach the potential zero where your, your goal is. So the whole idea of this potential field method is to construct this function over your search space and follow the gradient of this function, uh, the, the, the negative direction of this gradient, because that's where you get the maximum decrease. Uh, 
So it's kind of like a pictorial, let's say, in, in 1D. And let's say this is your desired goal. And you may have a potential function like this. So if you start from here, you have some value, right? Then you, you'll find the derivative here. And this is the derivative. But you will go to opposite direction. By going always on the opposite direction, you will reach another point. Again, you compute the derivative, and you follow the uh, opposite direction to, to reduce this potential value. So by doing this, you will reach here. Uh, but that's not always the case. For example, if you, if you don't design your uh, potential function in a good way, and let's say this is your So let's say this is your goal point, and it has a minimum. And you start from here. You will keep following this gradient. But when you reach here, you will not go anywhere. And you will get stuck here. So this is what we call local minima. So uh, you want to make your potential function such that the, goal, the desired goal location ha is the only minimum. But somehow, you may end up something like this, and you get stuck here. So this is the problematic. Uh, this is the kind of one of the drawback of this approach. So uh, like I said, uh, in this approach, you have a goal point to approach, and you have some obstacles to avoid. So you define your potential as a sum of two, pot two potential values. The first component is called attractor or attractive. And the second component is repulsive. So th the first component helps you to reach your goal point. The second one helps you to avoid uh, uh, obstacles in the environment. Uh, usually. Um, you define a metric, like you define how, how far you are from your current position to the obstacle, and these potentials are function of this uh, distance metric. So how you define your metric is very important in this case. So these are some uh, typical potentials for, uh, like attract, uh, to define attractive potentials. So here, it's a, it's a much, like it's, like it's a parabola. And here is conical. So uh, like if, you, if this is your desired goal, and if you are nearby, and if you, follow, if you define a gradient, it will be in this direction. It will be in this direction. And if you follow the opposite direction of the gradient, and you will, you will, you will get close to the goal point. So that's why like once you are nearby, it's like you, if, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you drop a marble here, and if you let it to follow the gradient, it will just keep rolling and reach the goal. So that's why these, fun, uh, these uh, potentials are called attractive potential. And they have different shapes. Uh, they have different properties. And usually in practice, people, they use uh, both, both of them. So this is the expression for um, paraboloidal potential. It looks a little bit scary, but it's not. I can explain on a simple example. So let's continue on this example. So the, the, the parabola the potential will be so our configuration space is x, y. 
then it is defined as Ka So this is this is just a distance vector between uh, let's say So let's say this is your goal, x, g, y, g. And you pick an arbitrary point, x and y. So what this expression says, it says take the difference between your goal and your existing point, current point. And this is a distance vector. And it says just take the kind of like a distance, the square of the distance. So uh, in this expression, if you place x, y to be your goal, then this term is 0. But if you are far away, it gets bigger and bigger. And we define that attractive force as a negative gradient. And we say, uh, And this gradient is nothing but derivative of this potential with respect to first coordinate. So you have this expression. If you take derivative with respect to x, it is 1 over 2 ka times multiply 1. If you do the same for y, so if you simplify this expression, then it will be Ka this will cancel, this will cancel. So this is, this is your force vector. So pictorially, what, what, what this means is like, you are at this point, and this is your desired point, so you, you define your potential, and it says the force, the force vector is in, uh, is, is in this direction. So what is this? This is it's a vector from x toward, towards the goal. And you, you have some coefficient. Like this, this, this component gives you the direction you want to move in order to reach the goal vector. Go, go, go position. And this is a, just a parameter you, you want to you wanna, uh, approach how fast. If, if it is very slow, then you will try to move along this direction, but it will be a very small step. If it is very large, then you will, you will try to take a big step. So for example, so this, is, this, is, this is the expression of this uh, attractor force. So if you pick another point here, this attractor force will be in this direction for this one. If you pick another one, it will be in this direction. If you pick here, it will be in this direction. As you can see, wherever, wherever you are, it tries to push you from where you are to the goal. That's why it, uh, it's called attractive force. Attractive force. <laughs> so you. You can do the same thing for this conical expression as well. Uh, maybe I should use other side.
So it is very similar structure. The only difference is uh, it takes the length and not the length square. And if you follow these steps as well, you can find uh, a tractor force to be. So it is kind of, it has the same nature, but it has this extra term here. And this is the uh, length of the error function. So you can think of uh, whenever, like wherever you pick a point here for your goal, and you have x, y point here, this tells, this is the direction you want to move, and but you normalize with this coefficient, and then this is unit, like this is a length one vector. And you multiply with this coefficient, then this tells you how much, like, let's say, k is two step. So this tells you how much you want to move in this direction. So it has very similar structure. By the way, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Yes? Then why would you use uh, cone versus uh, fraction? Because one of them is linear and one is cone. Well, so this is the answer. The, the first attractor behaves better than this conical one. But uh, the thing is, uh, um, like the, the first one, this increases infinitely. If you are further away from your goal, it's, it, it becomes very large. But the conical one, it, it is uh, it's constant. It's always like a uh, like if if you, if you look at the expression, it becomes constant. Uh, it's like it's always a unit length, like in the direction of the to, to the goal, and, and you just multiply with some coefficient. But this, this one, uh, it, it grows to infinity if you are very far away. So usually, what we do, um, so you define a you define a radius. Uh, let's say again here. So, you define this radius, and you say, if I'm at, if I'm uh, in, the, in, within this, if my error is within this radius, then I'm gonna use the, this expression. Otherwise, I'm gonna use this uh, conical. So it's kind of here, for all points here, you use, Parab par par parabolic expression, and outside you use conical. So you can think of uh, while you are here, the force will increase because uh, this parabolic expression, it increases as, as an error increase. So if you are within this co uh, ball, and if you are far away, this will be increasing. But the moment you step out here, and we know this conic is kind of constant, it will not. Uh, it will not increase. So, you, so if you if you have a kind of a. If you take this direction and if you just plot. Uh, let me show. So this is x goal, y goal.
so if if you try to if you try to see how the magnitude of the force uh, change as you move along this line, so at zero at at origin at uh, your goal it's zero. So if you try to let's say move in this direction in this direction, it will increase. Uh, because of this parabolic expression. And we know that if we don't use this radius, and if we just keep always using this, it will keep increasing, but we don't want this to happen. So the moment we hit the boundary, it becomes constant. And this is coming from conic, conic one, and this is coming from a parab parabolic expression. Yeah, conic one. Um, so this is how you define this uh, attractive potential and corresponding attractive forces. So the the, uh, the next one is how to define a repulsive pot potential. So this this potential helps you to uh, construct. Yes. Uh, the force change, uh, right? always stay the same, the change. I say again. Okay, so for the um, parabolic one, yes. like, um, but, but then when it's conical, then like the attractive force would just stay constant, right? Yes. So you would always need to have the uh, parabolic potential, like you, like when do you only use conical? Well, the the, the thing is. Um, when you when you construct this thing, if it goes to infinity, it's not good because you are trying to implement these things on real real, real robots, and you don't want to be, deal with uh, infinite values. So you can think of um, while I'm outside this um, uh, radius, I'm gonna approach the goal as a cons constant rate, but once I get to in the vicinity of the goal, then I will just uh, Slowing down, because if if you, if you use conic everywhere, uh, I mean you you will approach, but uh, this parabolic expression kind of achieves a smoother uh, transition. So the the second uh, potential is rep repulsive potential, and. Uh, so the, the, the whole idea of this is uh, like uh, when you have so let's say this is your goal and you have an obstacle here let's say The, the thing is, uh, you you want to define a potential such that uh, it will, whenever you try to close here, it will have a force that will push you away. So this is the idea. So if you're trying to, let's say you, your robot is here, uh, let's say, let's say this thing. Actually, let's, let's do this. Let's say you have an obstacle here, and you have your robot here, and we know that this uh, goal point will try to attract this guy. So that you will have have an attractor force in this direction, right? Then you will just keep following this, but this will get you to close to this obstacle, but you don't want to hit the obstacle. So that's why you have this kind of repulsive force. So 
when you follow this attractor, attractive force, you will keep coming here, and the moment you become uh, very close to obstacle, this repulsive force will be dominant, and it will push you away. So here, you will have an attractive force in this direction, and this uh, obstacle will push you away. Then you may have a net, and this guy will also some uh, force here. So here, you may have a force that is kind of something like this. So your robot will come here, and it will, it will try to avoid and try to reach here. So if you don't have these um, repulsive forces, uh, your robot may collide this obstacle while try to reach the, uh, the goal point. So this is how you define your uh, potential. So you can think of this kind of a radius. And if you, if you have a point, let's, let's say if you have an obstacle here, very far away, you don't want this thing to affect uh, to, to, your, to, to your robot. So that's why you have this uh, effective uh, uh, like influence parameter. Uh, you, set, you set this some values. That means this obstacle will have a repulsive force within this re region. And this guy will have this within this region. Beyond, beyond this, uh, this region, uh, it has no effect. It's zero. And here, this uh, new, this is the distance uh, to, the, to the obstacle. So you can think of, uh, so let, let, let me explain in one, one D as well. So let's say you have a one-dimensional space, X, and you have tiny obstacle here. So what this expression says, it says if your distance to obstacle is larger than some value, it's zero. Let's say we have this new value here. And it's the potential. So it is zero in this area. Uh, so what will happen if you if you are if you are very close to obstacle? Like for example, in this expression, what do you see? If this number is very, very small, then one over a small number is what? Very large, yes. So it's like here, something bad happens. <laughs> it is infinity. And beyond that, you have this kind of uh, decay. These are not that strong. So this is, the, this is the pattern of the potential. While you are very close to obstacle, it becomes very large. But as you move away, and when you reach the boundary, it keeps decaying and decaying. Um, so sometimes like, um, it becomes something like this. So while you are at the boundary of this expression, like if, if this distance is this value, then uh, actually in this expression, it is, it, 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 uh, this, this is not right. It just hits this point. That's why we have this extra term. So while you're at the boundary, it is zero. And if you are very close to the obstacle, it becomes to, uh, it, it becomes to infinite. And this pattern, uh, you may not you, you 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 may not like this. For example, you may say uh, I like this pattern or this pattern. So for this one, you play with these uh, parameters you have, like this 
gamma parameter. And this, de this defines how fast you decay or how slow you, uh, you decay. So a, a, a picture of this repulsive potential can be given like this. So here you have an obstacle. Um, so this, this is, this is, these are called equipotential contours. That means if you move along this contour, you will have the same potential. And if you get close to obstacle uh, at the boundary, it will be very large. Uh, and as you can see, uh, these, these, uh, the, like, the density of this equipotential equip contours is very dense when you get close to obstac obstacle because you see a very rapid change here. But here, it's much, much smaller value. And the way, like the, the way you change this potential, you, you, can, you can play with this parameter. And if you, if you use uh, larger gamma, then uh, this, this will increase much faster. So again, when you do the algebra, you can find the uh, repulsive force by using this expression. Uh, this is how you define the derivative of this function. <clears throat> so, mm. and once you define this uh, re repulsive force for one obstacle, uh, you can just add them up to uh, define the whole repulsive potential. For example, if you have two obstacles, you, you have one expression for this guy, and you have another expression for this guy, and you just sum them up. And this becomes your uh, repulsive potential. So once you define your uh, attractive potential, and once you define your uh, re repulsive potential, you just sum them up, and you get a, a total potential here. And the force field will be again the gradient, the minus, the, the negative, the opposite direction of the gradient of this potential. And it will be uh, an attractor force. And this is due to your goal point and a sum of uh, repulsive force. So this is how, we, uh, how the potential contours will look like. This is your goal point. And when you, if you don't have this obstacle, you will see all these circles. Uh, the uniform circles, but the moment when you put an obstacle here, uh, you see there's a disruption here, and this is because of the uh, repulsive forces. And here, <coughs> uh, and as you can see here, there's an interesting uh, phenomenon with what we call a local minimum. Because while you are here, uh, like this goal point will, you, will attract you to, towards itself, but this obstacle will block you to penetrate, and it will generate some force here, and your potential will be zero here. And when your potential is zero, then you will not have any force to guide you. So what this means is, if you are, let's say, here, and if you always follow the, uh, this force field, it will tell you, oh, your goal point is here. You should keep following and keep following, but the moment you hit this, plateau, uh, the potential will be zero, and you will not uh, move, and you got stuck here. So that's why uh, these uh, local planner, they are not complete. Do you know what completeness means? What is completeness? When, when you take into account every, uh, every factor that will contribute to your success. Yeah, I would say um, you, you try to solve a problem, and if there's a solution, like the problem is feasible, you want your algorithm to find the solution. That means the algorithm is complete. Uh, but for some algorithm, there is, there is a solution, but your alg algorithm is not capable of finding that solution. Then it's, the algorithm is called incomplete. And 
as engineers, we would like our algorithm to be complete because if there's a solution, we would like to find it. So uh, as you can see, this, this is a simple approach, but uh, it has some flaws, okay? It, it's not complete. But uh, this is very easy to implement uh, compared to other algorithms. So completeness is a very important property when you design algorithms. So uh, again, this is pictorial, uh, 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 the pictorial dep depiction of the, this total potential. So you have this expression due to your uh, goal, um, goal position. So it tries, to, so wherever you are, it tries to attract you to the goal. And you have these um, uh, like heels, and these are due to obstacles in the environment. So when you just sum them up, you will have this kind of uh, uh, heel-like expression. So if you are here, and it, like if you have a marble, if you just put it here and if it let it go, it will just go and roll, roll around this obstacle and you, it will reach the goal. So that's the whole idea of this potential field-based uh, method. <clears throat> so, um, so far, we try to define some potentials, and once we have this potential function, we try to uh, compute uh, the force that is uh, coming up from this potential. So, okay, now we have this force, what are we gonna do? There are many ways to use this force for planning purposes. Uh, in practice, people, uh, they prefer to use this approach. So what they do, once you have your force, you try to uh, align your speed uh, towards the, in, in, in the same direction of this force. Let's say you have a mobile robot, and at this point, this is x, y, position of the robot, and you have this heading, and this is the v. And let's say this is the goal point you wanna reach. So you, you, do, you do all this math and you have your U function and you have your total force and so at this point you will say, okay, what is the, what is the force in this uh, X, Y? Let's say it is uh, this direction. Maybe you have some obstacle here. That's why it prevents you to go here instead of directly going there. So in the third option, what we are trying to do, we say we have to somehow align this uh, velocity vector in the direction of this force field. Because we assume if we keep following this force field, and it will, it will take us to the goal point. So we have, to, we have to use our local planning techniques in a way that uh, to, to align this velocity vector with this guy. But the thing is, when you align this thing, this, will, this robot will move a little bit. And here you will have a different, different uh, uh, force, force direction and you, you have to realign your speed. So at every, at every position you try to guide your velocity vector uh, in, in the same direction with the force. Uh, like I said, uh, this is not a complete approach, and at some point, you may reach a point where the, f uh, the force vector is zero. That means you don't wanna move. But that place may not be the goal point you want to go. So that's why this approach has uh, this uh, local minima problem, and that, that causes the algorithm to be incomplete. So how can we use uh, this potential field method for uh, local planning of a uh, wheeled robot. Uh, so once, once we, have a, we have a robot, we try to identify its equations of motion. Like this expression tells how a mobile robot uh, can move in space. <clears throat> so what, what this does is, So this, this, this whole expression um, saying that you can control the position and you can control the orientation of the vehicle by choosing two uh, speed commands. 
This is linear speed, this is the uh, angular speed. So, and so, uh, in, in, in quick summary, I can explain like a quick question. If V is zero, and if you have non-zero omega values, what will happen? Yes? Yeah, like uh, if this V is zero, right? And let's say for, uh, V is zero, and omega, you have omega. So in, in this expression, you will have this uh, kind of omega angular speed. So what it will do, let's say you have this. So it will just uh, spin uh, around this axis. So if you set, if you set omega to be zero, and if you just have some non-zero forward speed, then you will have this kind of motion. So you have this V, and you, you don't have any uh, rotational speed, and you will just keep moving along this direction. And this is, you have V, and omega is zero. This is called pure rotation. This is called pure translation. So what will happen if you have both? For example, you have, a con you have a constant V and constant omega. Well, uh, there's a nice geometric expression. Let's say your angular speed is this direction, and this is your V. So it will, this robot will move along a circle. And, and this circle will have radius r. This is the constraint they have. So if you have a non-zero forward, uh, forward speed and if you have non-zero angular speed and if, if you assume they are constant, it will make an arc motion. It will keep rotating around the circle and you will have a radius of that circle and uh, it is, you can think of its ratio of V omega R. And this, this is a very nice expression so here you can, you can think of a, so uh, if this R is small, you, you, are gonna, you, are, you are gonna move on a very small, uh, smaller arc, right? So that means you, do, you, you don't have that much um, like forward speed. And if you set V to be zero, then what will happen? You, you, you will reduce the pure rotation because you are not moving and you will just keep rotating uh, at the same point. So what happens if you set omega to be zero? Then if V is constant, omega is zero, then this R will go to infinite. That means uh, you, are, you, are, you are moving on a straight line because you can think of this straight line motion, you are, you are turning around a very, uh, big arc and the radius is r, uh, infinite. So it's like that's why you have this kind of uh, straight motion. So by using this geometric expression, you can capture pure rotation, pure translation, and uh, moving along arc. So if you change omega and 
w, then that means uh, the, uh, the turn radius will change as a function of time. So that's, that's why you will have this kind of motion. Like you will have this kind of motion. Like at every, at every time you will have a different r. So this is kind of a geometric expression uh, for movement of a uh, robot. So usually uh, you have this expression, and this, this expression captures all these uh, motion behaviors. And when you do local path planning, you usually um, do two, two things. The first one is called posture regulation and you have a desired goal position and you want to reach here. And in the second one, uh, you are given a reference, a desired path, and you would like to uh, get close as, as much as possible to, to this path. So um, the whole idea of this local, um, local planning is how to define uh, laws to find omega, uh, V and omega. Like I said, uh, the, the local planner, it will take a goal point and it will have an obstacle and it will use some uh, algorithm to generate desired uh, V and omega. So, so let's say, and So let's say the robot is at this position and it has this angular speed and maybe it has some uh, rotation speed omega as well. So you, you, you do the math, you compute the potential, then you compute the force here. How can you leverage this force information to find some uh, values for desired velocity, angular, ve uh, angular velocity and translational velocity? Well, uh, like I said, the idea of this local uh, planner is to align this force, uh, like the, this velocity vector, in the direction of the f uh, force vector. So that means at this position, you may say, I should compute this angle, let's say theta force, and I should, I should command omega to match to this guy. Uh, you, you, you guys know um, P, P controller, like Kyle mentioned P controller? So you can think of, for an omega, we can design a control law, and it will, it will be based on simple P controller. So the current value of the current, um, the current orientation of the robot is theta, and you want it to be theta f, and you, you can control this. So what you can do, you can say, okay, I will have this omega, and I will have this gain, let's say, k theta, and I will compute the error vector, and it is this. If you set it to be large, uh, then it will, uh, it will generate a very large angular, um, angular speed command. So usually you, you define this k theta to be positive and you, you, you tune the parameter. So this is simple uh, P controller. <clears throat> so how can you find this um, theta f? Well, uh, if you know this force vector, you can, you can, tr and you can decompose this to FTY, FTX, then you can say uh, theta f is arc tangent to so um, in your Python code you can use you can call this function like 
you will have the component of this force vector, and it will tell uh, the angle between this vector and the, 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 the x-axis, then you will use this as a kind of reference here, and you will have your controller for So this will be your uh, local planner uh, for, for defining your uh, omega command. <clears throat> so for, for linear velocity, what can we do? Well, um, what we can do is uh, we can project this vector along this one. So let me clean up again. So we have this V vector here, and we have this theta, and let's say we have this force vector. So you can project this guy along this, ax this vector and you can compute this guy, and you can use it, like for example, as a kind of a, um, uh, like a linear speed command. And this projection is given by uh, that expression, and it is, uh, sine theta. So um, the whole idea is for a given position of the rover, and you know the orientation, angular speed, and velocity, you just compute this vector. Then you take this vector, you use this arc tangent function to find this angle, and this will become your error in your orientation. And you will use a simple gain controller uh, to find the desired angular um, speed. For, for, uh, for the velocity one, you can say I'm going to project this vector along this one, and you will, you will have the desired comment. Um, so think of like, um, so let's, let's think of like, if this force vector is aligned with this uh, velocity, then what will happen? You will have a very large component. If this is very, um, like, 90 degree, and you will do a projection, and you will, you will comment a very like, small, small comment values, you will comment to zero. So think of, like, a, if, the, if the desired, like, if this force, if your existing speed is perpendicular, and at next time step you say, uh, I'm going to comment V to be zero, because I don't want to move this direction, because this is completely opposite direction I want to go. But if somehow this force field is this, uh, in this direction and you are, you are already moving in this direction, you don't want to change your V. You will say, okay, keep, 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 keep driving in the direction you're already driving. So this is the whole idea of uh, how to define a local, um, uh, local planner. Um, yeah, so this is what I explained. Uh, but there is one caveat, like um, when, like um, not 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 every robot, they have this kind of mechanism. Like, uh, so this 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 technique will work if you have a robot with differential drive. That means by changing this uh, speed in this direction, you can, you can command instantaneous rotational speed. But uh, for more practical or vehicle, like, or maybe the vehicle you have, uh, you, may, you may have a mechanism like this.
So uh, in, a, in, a in a typical uh, vehicle, you have uh, front wheels and you have a steering angle command. And by changing this steering angle command, you induce some rotation motion uh, for, for this vehicle. So if you, want to go, if you want to drive forward, you just say steering angle to be zero and it will keep driving forward. If you want to make a right rotation, then you give some values to this guy and it will, it will make motion like this. So in this, um, like this is called Ackermann's, Ackermann's steering. And in, in this type of robots, uh, you have to uh, somehow uh, convert, um, like your goal will be to find V and a steering angle command. So the, the question is, um, We know how to define a tracking, uh, like a, a local planner for this type of robots. How can we leverage this uh, control law uh, to convert it to a steering angle, a steering angle command? Well, here you, you use a little bit geometry here. So uh, when you study the motion of this robot, So uh, when, you, when you give a steering angle here, you will realize uh, these, like if, if you draw a line here from uh, this wheel, and if you draw a line from this, they will intersect a point. And this is called instantaneous uh, uh, center of rotation. And we know this is 90 degrees, and we know this is 90 minus phi, and this means this is phi. So, uh, and we know the length of this wheel, and we know this uh, radius of this uh, rotation, and you can say tangent phi to be L over rho. Uh, in, in, in the previous expression, we had um, theta dot to be omega, but now uh, we know that omega is related uh, because it, it, it rotates around um, a radius and it is uh, related like something like this. So from here, um, <clears throat> you, can, you can say one over rho is tangent phi over L, and you plug this expression here, then you will say uh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. This is Yeah, I'm confused. So uh, the, the the bottom line is like uh, you can you can use this geometric expression and you can plug this phi expression into this uh, omega like the omega area, and this will give you a relation between the steering wheel and desired omega. And by using this expression, you can convert any desired uh, angular speed command into desired steering command. So you can use the same tracking, uh, tracking control law, and you can just compute this omega here and velocity command here. And by, by using this expression, you can compute the uh, corresponding uh, steering angle command. So this will be the final uh, feedback control scheme. 
So at, at, any every, at every given x, y, you can compute the force. And from the force, then you can compute the desired speed comment like this. Then again, you can use uh, this geometric expression and this gain control law to, to, to compute desired um, omega. Then you can take these two input and co convert it to a desired string angle if you have a, yes? Instead of converting the rotational velocity, could you just like, work, like change the steering angle and then once the IMU detects it, it Well, uh, for IMU, you can understand like the state information, but uh, IMU will not tell you where you want to go. Like I, IMU will tell you how fast you are moving or how fast you are rotating. These are, um, these are like the desired command you want to achieve in order to reach the, the goal point you want. So that's the difference, I think. But um, you, you will use IMU uh, in a filter um, to define your existing orientation, to define your uh, uh, maybe existing speed. Uh, like you use those sensors to understand how fast you are moving or what is your orientation. Uh, like before, um, before uh, taking a new uh, command, you have to know what you are doing right now. Once you know that, and once like you know what, you, if you learn w what you are doing right now, and if you want where you want to go in the future, then by using this information, you, you can define your control law. So this is um, this is how we define the local. Pl uh, the local planner uh, for Ackerman steering vehicle using potential field. Uh, so in this expression, like the ho the, on the, the only important thing is uh, this uh, force, like at um, total force expression, and uh, uh, you you define this force by using some uh, like repulsive force, repulsive force, and attractive force, and there are some parameters you have to tune it for your problem. So that's all I have. Any questions? Um, so I'm not sure if you mentioned this, but what if, what if you end up in like a local minimum or like a flat area? Well, uh, there are some, like for example, I didn't mention Let's say uh, your robot is here, right? And you have an obstacle here. So this guy will tell you, move in this direction. And let's say they have the same distance. And this guy will tell you, move in this direction. So these two will cancel each other and you will stay where you are. So this is an example of a local minima. And you, what you can do, uh, you, can, you, you can induce some uh, randomness. Like uh, you will say, I'm going to compute uh, this repulsive force one, this repulsive force two, and you will add them up. So you will have the total force expression. then you will say f random. You will assume this randomness will help you. Like this, this is a very, very, very simple approach. You'll just put some little bit noise. And if you have a symmetric case, and that random thing will cause you from, to move from here somewhere, and once you move there, then you will, you will break the symmetry. So this is one, this is one of the simple case. Uh, the other thing is, um, if you, uh, you can you you can you can try to look ahead. L let's say um, at the end of the day, like we are trying to give uh, the next position of the robot uh, to be by using this for, uh, speed commands, right? So if you if you pick a speed command, you may end up uh, let's say you have omega and this guy. So you can um, 
you can use this, uh, like you can use this forcing to compute some nominal v and omega, and you can try to put noise here. It's like uh, you will use force expression and it will give you some v and omega, but you will say instead of uh, following this one, you will put some noise delta v and you will put some delta v here. So this is another place where you can put some randomness to avoid such cases. But uh, no matter what you do, you, 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 can all, you may always get stuck in a local minima. So that's the drawback of this approach, but it's very simple. It's not complicated. Tomorrow I'm gonna explain some search algorithms. You will see they are much more complicated, but uh, the advantage is they are complete. Um, yes? What are the subscripts FT, comma, X, and that is a vector component? Yes, like this is a vector, and uh, maybe I should have said, this is my, let's say this is my X and Y. This is my kind of frame. So you have this vector, you just project this thing along this Y axis and X axis. Uh, so like, this, this, is a, this is represented by two values, right? FTX and FTY. Um, so once you have this, you just plug it here and you get your desired speed command. So why are you then multiplying the... This one. Like I said, uh, I have this vector here and I'd like to project this thing onto this vector. And this is, like this is the projection. So this, this is like, a, let's say if theta is zero, right? Then if theta is zero, then you are projecting on x axis, right? If theta is zero, this term is, will be gone, and this will be one, and you will get FTX. So it's kind of like a, you are projecting um, this vector on a rotating frame. I can show you offline, how, how you can do it. But this, this is kind of a quick formula. Okay, thank you so much.